in ways that go beyond moral criticisms of greedy capitalists, corporate behemoths, power-hungry economists, and oligarchs posing as Democrats. In everyday politics today, the economic question appears in two contrary ways. One, through the populist rendering of economic grievances into culturalist rhetoric against enemies of the people, diversely labeled as the deracinated global elite or intimate enemies like Muslims and Jews, or indeed quintessential foreigners like Indians and Chinese. And B, by an abstract and inscrutable policy language which quietly transforms the democratic citizen into the needy beneficiary, the activist subject of political rights into the passive object of economic amelioration. Precisely the dynamic that has led to economics being often called an anti-politics machine. In fact, I would suggest that these apparently contrary orientations are two sides of the same coin. For the more reified and alienated formal economic concepts become, the more they tend to be culturalized and reduced to the identity question in popular politics. My presentation today is a modest, ground-clearing exercise, as much for my own clarification as for eliciting your comments, which asks, how do we, as students of politics, engage the economic question in new ways? To begin with, let me set aside the two ways in which we have so far engaged the economic from within political theory. The first way has been to critique the economic determinism of orthodox Marxism. That job, I think, is done. Nobody disputes anymore that the abstract category of economic class has often been deployed to suppress the social facts of race, caste, gender, and religion. And that capitalism is not, and has never been, a universalizing imperative because it always already produces its own outside, namely the domains of the colonized, the racialized, the informal, the underdeveloped, the destitute, the obsolete, and the waste. The second way in which we have engaged the economic from within political theory has been via a critique of the state versus market dichotomy of neoclassical economics. As you know, Foucault described the rise of free market liberalism in Europe as, to use his own phrase, the introduction of economy into politics, by which he meant that modern governmentality, unlike earlier forms of sovereign power, works to the deployment of economic tools like productivity measures, statistics, demographics, national accounting, cost-benefit analysis, and so forth. In this reading, the economy appears as a political form unto itself, and the discipline of economics an instrument of rule, though disguised as a natural, universal, and therefore an apolitical form of knowledge. No doubt, the social critique of economic determinism and the political critique of liberal governmentality 
have been important lessons for us. And yet, it seems to me that these perspectives remain content with being outsider critics. They reduce the economy rather too quickly into society and polity and stop short of a rigorous engagement with economic concepts and techniques. They also do not engage the important fact that unlike philosophical, aesthetic, or even political concepts, economic concepts have been largely resistant to post-colonial and decolonial criticism, which is why they continue to partake in the kind of abstract universalism that a priori resists translation into the language of democratic politics. The question that I want to put on the table today is therefore, how can we, as students of politics, incorporate a rethinking of economics within the broader research agenda of a new Indian political thought? Provisionally speaking, we can take a two-pronged approach to this question. A of historicizing economics and B of thinking through the conceptual mismatches between the vocabularies of economics and political philosophy. First, what does historicizing economics entail? As we know, most mainstream economics departments in the world no longer teach courses on the history of economic thought. Because contemporary economics claims a kind of trans-historical technical validity for its disciplinary protocols. Even when the history of economic thought is taught by heterodox practitioners of the discipline, it is usually as a narrative of great European thinkers Adam Smith, Ricardo, Marx, Marshall, Keynes, and so on, or at most as a narrative of the failure of development in the global south. Although, as we know, development studies has mostly come to become a separate discipline from economics in most global institutions. Is it then possible at all to incorporate a differently formulated history of economics in our political studies and history departments? It's important to emphasize here that the history of economics is not economic history. Economic history was, as we know, the reigning paradigm of the Indian social sciences until the 1980s, undergirded by the dream of national development, Marxist political economy, and an unshakable faith in a universal transition from feudalism to capitalism to socialism. Largely a narrative of changing modes and relations of production and of changing class structures and class mobilization, Indian economic history saw economic categories such as labor, productivity, factors of production, utility, welfare, and so on as self-evident and given. Economic history even informed political theory as scholars used Gramsci's notion of passive revolution to characterize Indian democracy as a class settlement between modern bourgeois capitalists and pre-modern landed elites. As you know, this version of economic history failed to make sense of actual politics on the ground leading to a widespread critique 
of its Eurocentric and derivative nature, and a general cultural and or linguistic term in the academia, and a widespread disinterest in the economic question. In recent times, however, we are beginning to see the emergence of a history of the economic as opposed to economic history among scholars of South Asia self-consciously drawing on post-colonial and or decolonial perspectives. This new history of the economic primarily reconstructs the entangled carriers of economics and empire. Ritu Birla's work is very interesting in this respect. She shows how between 1870 and 1930, the colonial state implemented a barrage of commercial and contract laws in India, including measures regulating companies, income tax, charitable gifting, insurance, and procedures distinguishing popular gambling from specialized speculation and futures trading in order to suppress vernacular economic practices that rested on kinship, caste, religious, and other affiliational networks for trade, credit, and manufacture. The result was the creation through legal fiat, as it were, of an abstract sphere of contractual relations called the market or the economy, which the state sought to deliberately cleanse of any social or cultural balance, creating an enduring binary between the universalistic economy and particularistic cultures. The historian Manu Goswami, on her part, shows the colonial antecedents of leading economic thinkers of the 19th and early 20th century. Thus, Robert Malthus occupied the first professorship of political economy in the East India Company's school, which trained generations of Indian colonial administrators, James Mill, who synthesized the work of Ricardo, and his more famous son, John Stuart Mill, were both long-run administrators in the Indian, uh, India office in London. James Wilson, the founder of The Economist, the most significant journal of free market liberalism, which commands great prestige even today was colonial India's first Minister of Finance starting 1859. Alfred Marshall, the founding figure of neoclassical economics and the leader of the marginalist revolution that changed the focus of economics from social classes to value-optimizing individuals. And John Maynard Keynes, whose first work was in colonial India, and who went on to become the foundation of post-Second World War British and American welfare economics, both began their career at the India office and served on economic reform committees concerning the colonies. Not just for the colonial period, we have new work on the career of economics in India for the post-colonial decades as well. Nikhil Menon's recent work discusses the rise of Indian statistics in relation to not only centralized Soviet planning systems, but also American neoclassical economics, including Milton Friedman's famous ideas, leading to, a, to an enduring tension between development and democracy, which is yet to be resolved. All I'm trying to say here through these random citations is that we now have enough scholarship to help us teach and research the economy as part of a decolonial political studies curriculum. However, despite being a historian myself, I feel that it is not a 
and not only to historic science, and show our decolonial antecedents of the discipline of economics. We also need to do comparative conceptual work, which might help us positively rethink economic concepts today. Political theorists are well placed to do this. Given their experience in deconstructing received normative political concepts, such as democracy or sovereignty or secularism. Let me just take one example to explain what I mean by comparative conceptual work that may help us think through the generic mismatches between the languages of economics and political philosophy. As we know in economics, both Marxist and liberal, the economic is imagined as founded on production, with distribution and consumption imagined as derivative concepts. The modern fantasy of infinite growth derives from this foundational productivism, as do the putatively universal concepts of capital and labor, both of which are imagined as infinitely generative of value out of their internal dynamic of accumulation and productivity. In popular politics, however, distribution, or rather redistribution, especially of food, land, and credit, appears as the critical moment. In other words, the conceptual mismatch between the economy of economics and the economy of politics appear as the constitutive incommensurable, incommensurability between a productivist and a redistributive imaginary. As we know, the hegemonic economic concept of productivity has been historically pegged to the late 19th, early 20th century Anglo-American image of the white, male, industrially employed, family breadwinner. This figure obviously makes no sense in the post-colonial context, where populations are only rarely industrially employed and who experience labor not as organized factory work, but in fact as what the anthropologist James Ferguson calls social labor, the ceaseless everyday negotiations by the poor of political, bureaucratic, kin, and neighborhood networks of power and patronage. Therefore, instead of welfare, as a form of succor for the unemployed, the retired, the injured, or the single mother, figures that detract from the normative, fully employed male worker subject of Keynesianism, what we have in the post-colony is a generic demand for redistribution without any connection to the idea of productivity or labor. We can sense the depth. We can sense the depth of this conceptual mismatch between productivism and distributionism if we look at India's 20th century political history and popular culture. In India, we know land redistribution, debt amnesty, and subsidy struggles have been far more widespread than trade union movements around work hours and employment benefits. 